Hi there. Um, <clears throat> welcome to this, what I hope will be an exciting fireside chat with Anthony uh, Romero, who is the, uh, the head of the ACLU, and also um, Rashida Richardson, who has a long, illustrious um, CV here as well, which I won't go all the way through, but started, um, worked actually at the ACLU as well, all the way through to um, um, the Director of Research at AI Now, uh, AI Now Institute, and also is a visiting scholar at the Rutgers Law School. Welcome to you both. Um, it feels like every day, it must feel like every day to you more so, Anthony and Rashida, that there's some you know, crazy new um, civil and political crisis that is facing the US. And I just want to pay my respect to both of you and also some sympathies as well for just having to deal with uh, everything that's going on in the US. But today's announcement, <laughs> kicking right off the bat from the president, is um, relates to the, the date of the US election. Um, and I think it's something that we've been waiting for in a way, and probably you guys have been waiting for it, or, um, you know, the possibility of, of the president actually announcing that an election should be delayed. Um, there's obviously legal, many legal constraints preventing that from happen, happening. But Anthony, do you want to just kick off and let us know like what that tweet says, what it means, um, and how the ACLU would respond to such a suggestion? He, he doesn't have the power. I mean, it's just, he's just rattling everyone's cage, whether you're sitting in an apartment in Brooklyn <laughs> or in Australia or overseas, or it's just, this is a president that's just, uh, taken it as his mission to torment broad swaths of the American public. And I think we have to take some of what he does very seriously. I think another bunch of it, we just have to kind of write it off to the man who's in the Oval Office as <clears throat> becoming unhinged and using these new technologies as a way to make us all unhinged. There's no way he can push back the date of the election. There, he's been mm -hmm. on uh, on Twitter today all about kind of vote by mail and the fraud. And, you know, what I would say to Brett and to my friends and colleagues is like, we all have to take a deep breath and take what he says with an enormous grain of salt and just mm. keep our heads down and focus and not, and not rise to the bait of it all. Um, Mm, mm. But you know the th the thing about the about the U.S. election or about any election really, and we've talked about elections all week at RightsCon, um, yeah. how yeah. governments are trying to to interfere. You know, we've seen internet shutdowns happening uh, all over the world, often connected to an inter to to an election in the lead up to an election, during an election, or even post an election, when you know governments or leaders don't want the actual results to be communicated. Um, and so, you know, ultimately, this is perhaps like the most important civil and political right that we have, which is to be able to sure. determine uh, our, our leader. Um, so sure. do you think that do, do you think that Trump in doing this? I mean, obviously, we've seen the, the, the US economy tank. Um, there's been a 10 percent reduction in GDP just announced, I think, yeah. today as well. Today. Yep. Do you think he kind of, I mean, I, I know you've, you've probably spent the last, you know, close on four years trying to understand the mind um, of the president, but do you think he understands that, like, that the, the election is actually a fundamental defining um, moment and, and, and kind of infrastructure of American democracy, or do you think he just doesn't even know or care? No, I think he definitely cares. I mean, I think part of what you're seeing is, uh, and we ought not underestimate his attention to the facts or to the polls. Um, I think he clearly apprehends. I mean, no one fully knows what goes through his mind except he um, himself. But I think the the understanding that the poll numbers show that he is very much underwater in most of the kind of face-to-face -face polls and even done by Fox News and other of the outlets and kind of really important battleground states. The idea that we're actually talking about Texas uh, and states like Georgia and elsewhere being in play is kind of uh, every Republican's nightmare. Um, and, you know, the Democratic Party uh, is trying to capitalize upon it. I, I, I'm not sure they, 
we'll see how they do. Um, but I know that that uh, I think the president's focus on these set of issues is is kind of rooted in understanding that uh, he's got to play. He's not going to be able to pull many of the independents he once thought he could get or that he once had. So the way to do this is to actually galvanize his base with the kind of highest amount of turnout and energy and froth and kind of throw them the law and order card, use the race dog whistles that are kind of audible now to all of us very clearly and loudly. And then he's going to try to find a way to kind of to suppress the vote in some key states. And, you know, I'd be really interested in, in hearing questions from the audience about how it's played out, especially in other country context. This is not, um, I mean, this this playbook that we're seeing in America is a lot like some of the international playbooks we've seen in other countries. And I've been spending a lot more time with my counterparts in other countries trying to make sure that we understand what's played out in kind of failed or faulty elections and what could play out here. But I think it's especially important that we that we be ready. And um, certainly in the kind of states where he's endeavoring to kind of shut down the access to vote by mail, and to limit access to the polling booths, both in terms of geographies and in terms of uh, temporal restrictions on the right to vote, uh, it's gonna be critically important. Rashida, what would you say? What would to you bring, add to this? Yeah, I, I, was gonna, I was gonna actually- Am I too optimistic? Um, should, I be, should I be paying more attention to the tweets <laughs> than I am, or am I just too inured to it all? What would you suggest to it? No, I- I think it's all a distraction and it's and in some ways can have some intention behind it because it keeps you distracted by working to fight for people's rights. It keeps you distracted, um, but it it sort of coalesces his base. So I do think I agree with everything you just said around sort of the political tactics, but I also think the way that you can see most of this administration is an onslaught of tactics of distraction. Hmm. Rashida, do you can I also um, ask you because the the, the tactics of distraction um, are also you know there are victims of that as well and there are scapegoats and there are um, personalities and identities and a lot of the identities that we're talking about is like the sort of the progressive left has been demonized as a means to sort of in the certainly in the way that the protests uh, the black lives matter protests have been portrayed um, but also i think there's as as uh, anthony hinted to there's there's a there's a there's a race issue at play there's a dog whistle that's at play um, and i'd love to hear from you um how you think that's playing out and and sort of where in terms of like the right to protest in the us and also the right to protest digitally as well which is a very important element in this new iteration of dissent um, how does, um, firstly, how would you characterize how the, the Black Lives Matter movement um, writ large is kind of coping with this? And also, um, how do you see the kind of, I'm sorry for the big questions, but like, you know, how do you sort of see the historical or uh, well, the history of, of the US um, um, in, in terms of racial justice and injustice issues? Like, how do you see that playing out now in, this current, in the lead up to this current election? Yeah, so I think the uprisings that started after the murder of George Floyd have kind of evolved in a concerning way for me. Um, not so much on, like there definitely are attacks on the First Amendment front and people's ability to exercise that right. But I also feel like there is also a problem of abstraction and distraction happening too. And that if you look at most of the recent media coverage and even the general narratives around Portland and the um, protests in many other cities, um, you don't even hear Black Lives Matter or racial justice or what people are protesting about as right. much. And now the narrative is more about the sort of abuse of power being exerted by federal authorities, the white wall of moms and other aspects that I think actually distract and take a lot of attention away from the very important and necessary work that needs to happen around criminal justice reform and advancing racial justice. And I think it also serves to distract us from the ways that oppressive practices and cultures that were the whole cause of this protest are now being reintroduced in society under a new veneer. And I think it was yesterday, the Chicago police announced that they're creating a new crime hotspots unit 
And that's coming only months after they just discontinued their predictive policing program and other problematic pro practices. And while they're marketing this as something different, the composition and the culture of what's really a historically problematic police department hasn't changed. And so that's no longer the focus. And I'm also seeing this happen, um, this type of dilution and distraction happening in the social media space. This week, I think the most, the thing that came to my attention is this effort of women supporting women where people are uh, posting photos and it's mostly white women um, of black and white photos of themselves under the guise of empowerment. But then recent reporting uh, demonstrated that this is actually diluting a social media campaign to bring more visibility to femicide in Turkey. So I think we need to be very clear about what the issues are and make sure that we're not allowing ourselves as the people pushing for change to be distracted by tactics by this administration or even well-intentioned but flawed um, uh, peers. Mm. Th thank you. Thanks so much for that. It's a, um, absolutely central to this discussion. And I think, um, you know, more broadly across the world, actually, as well, we've seen, um, you know, the sort of like concentration, I think, of power. I mean, Evgeny Morozov said some time ago that um, back in 2010 and 2011, that technology was actually going to be the enabler of the autocrat. And 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 um, I was thrilled as I think you were as well. Um, judging by some of the responses that I've seen in in, in the work that you've done, Rashida, um, in the response to Tendai Achume's um, re um, report on race, injustice, um, and technology. In fact, she actually, as I indicated in the opening, she she issued a whole report to the General Assembly just on this matter, and demonstrated how. It's not just about the dysfunctional conversation that happens on Twitter, for instance, it's actually about the inherent racial racism that's in the technology infrastructure. Can you talk to that for a second? And I know that you also helped to craft a statement in support of that um, report. And there's a number of recommendations in there, one of which is that racist technology should be banned. I mean, I think that's your first recommendation. It would be great to hear about that yeah. in the context of the US yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, I think this is kind of the global problem with tech development and just its proliferation in government and society is that technology and data, which is the core for what a lot of these newer technologies are based on, are often seen as a historical or a political. And I think when you ignore mm -hmm. or even erase what are really deeply cultural and political significant histories, then the threats posed by these technologies and new data practices seem new, seem complicated, and seem different um, from the social context in which they're embedded. But they're part of that history, and often, in some ways, they're helping conceal and perpetuate the problems we see. So in the statement that we put out in support of what's really a profound report, um, we're sort of supporting these calls for changes and some of them is also trying to expand what we're seeing as racially biased technologies because i think a lot of the public discourse focuses a lot on facial recognition which is problematic and we can go into that into great detail but it's not the only problematic mm -hmm. technology it's part of this cycle of like tech solutionism that's within the tech industry of thinking what are really complex and nuanced social issues can be easily fixed by some data application or some new technology, but not thinking about whose worldview that that is sort of instilling and what are we optimizing mm -hmm. for with a lot of these technologies, since most of them are optimization um, technologies. Mm. Uh, what's really interesting, and maybe I can bring Anthony in here as well, you talk about tech solutionism. Um, as being part of the solution. The report actually squarely places the cause of the problem or the exacerbator of the problem at the, at the front doorstep or at the feet of the, of the tech giants. Um, and, and, and I think when we start also to look at things like um, digital identity, when it's not just about your content that you're, that you're uploading or downloading, it's actually about your very digital identity um, your identity, yeah. the way in which you operate online and with this yeah. rapid digital acceleration. Um, so Anthony, tell us, I mean, if any reflections on, you know, Rashida's comments and also like thinking yeah. about 
the role of technology in the achievement or denial of civil and political rights? Sure, definitely. I mean, that's another big question, but glad to try to tackle it and also get your own thoughts because <laughs> uh, mine are still evolving and being informed. But first, I very much want to echo and appreciate uh, Rashida's kind of point that it's not just one technology that's mm -hmm. a problem, like facial recognition, but it's the way in which these the, the, these technologies are developed, the ubiquitousness in our daily lives that is increasingly of concern to us. And we've taken you know, very strong stances against the use of facial recognition technologies, especially in law enforcement. Um, we had recently the case of one man who was arrested uh, uh, based on kind of a false facial recognition match. We've been kind of pushing this. I know this has been an issue, Brett, that you know better than I, but, uh, and it's not a surprise then that the, the false matches, the false positives end up being much more about people of color and the kind of the racial yeah. inaccuracies around facial recognition just underscores the problem when you deal with facial recognition in an already a racist criminal justice system. Oh my God, it's just kind of adding more, more wood onto a, an out of control fire. So I, I think we need to kind of really unpack it and see it as, as much as we can. My own thinking has evolved. I mean, I appreciate being able to see you and spend time with you. You know, when you and I first met years ago, I had very much thought in, in a kind of a very binary way that there was the digital world and then there was the real world. And, you know, I had a digital program and then I had the rest of my program. I had digital organizers and I had other programs. Uh, other organizers, I had digital fundraisers, and then I had other fundraisers. I mm. want to say that you were totally right, that that distinction makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> and I'm now living in a kind of a fused digital real world where it's all the same and one of the same, and it doesn't make much difference. And I was stuck, I was struck by just, yeah. especially in the events uh, from the, you know, after the murder of George Floyd and the protests of across the country uh, about police murder, police abuse, brutality of black communities. I was struck in some jurisdictions we mm. read about, they're taking down the cell towers, right? So that the, the protesters in real time couldn't communicate with each other, couldn't text, couldn't upload their pictures or videos. It kind of reminded me of the conversations I had with colleagues in, in Egypt, the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, EIPR and Gasser, my counterpart there, about yeah. that's exactly what they did to Tahrir Square. I mean, you know this really well. And, and then, then looking mm -hmm. about how the, the space of organizing is very much all now tied with physical organizing, with digital organizing, digital identity and physical space. And it's all playing out in Portland, you know, in real time. And you know, I think that these distinctions I once held between there's the digital programs and digital strategies and the real strategies and the real world strategies, it's all all a jumble and it's all going to be addressed as one big kind of part of a, of a mm. way that the government is both interfacing and reacting I, and controlling. And I think we have to begin, mm. I say, in my own organization, we have to infuse kind of a sophistication and knowledge of kind of the, the virtual world in each and every single aspect of our programs. And that has come out in the litigation we brought recently against Facebook on the discrimination uh, on their algorithm, on their advertising uh, based on housing, credit and employment. I, I've had to infuse kind of an understanding of these algorithms in my racial justice project, in my women's rights project. It wasn't enough for me to just have this work sit in a technology project. It really needed to be in all other places. Mm. And in the COVID moment, I can't tell you that the, the kind of conversations I've been having where, you know, the titans of tech who usually run from the hills from me uh, were chasing me down to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation so that they could kind of cajole me or bludgeon me or corner me into supporting these web-based contact tracing apps. Right. Literally. I mm. mean, I don't kiss and mm. tell. Otherwise, there's no way there's no way to live in, it, in, in my in my job, in my life. But some of them were all out altercations with raised voices where they were basically saying to me, unless mm. you get behind one of these apps and these technologies, blood will be on your hands and people will die as a result of it. And I just thought, you know. My job is to raise the, the, the civil liberties, the privacy concerns on these technologies, especially as they relate to communities that don't have advocates. I remember one 
tech titan who's worth a fortune saying to me, I said, look, this is the Molotov cocktail that is my biggest nightmare. It's personal identifiable information. It's possibly funded by and accessed by the federal government. It's broadcast to one's neighbors. Uh, it, it, is, it is in these smartphones that you, most people don't fully understand the terms of service when they upload any app. You know, that you've got to allow me the skepticism and the worry and the concern. Oh, Anthony, the, the COVID pandemic is the great equalizer. We're all getting it equally. This is like in the first week of it. I'm like, bullshit. Mm. I bet you mm. that it's communities mm. of color and low-income communities who are really going to bear the brunt of this. And then when the first study came out mm -hmm. in early, early April, late March, that it was black and Latino communities that were really affected by the COVID pandemic and dying and getting contracting the disease at greater rates than the white communities because of the essential job classifications and other uh, systemic racism in the health uh, of, of our communities. Uh, th then the conversation shut down saying, this is the reason why we have to be skeptical because uh, the, the, the impact of a pandemic on certain communities would be greater or worse depending on who you are. And that these technologies are not going to be the great mm. equalizer and no disease is a great equalizer in an uneven and unequal playing field. So we really need to take it all apart and take yeah. it back together again, Brett. I think it's it's essential that you and we have need the to expertise do, and, and to we, help us with. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, I think we, we you know, we're doing this all in real time. Uh, and, 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 and I wanted to come back to, I mean, this is Anthony, so much that you said then, I'm sure Rashida, has a number of points that she'd like to raise as well. Let me just bring us back to the right to protest because I think it was a very, very interesting development that happened in the last couple of days where the special rapporteur actually at RightsCon um, talked to this new, or not this new, but to this concept of the fusing of the right to political protest um, as, a, as a human right that needs to be protected in the digital environment. And in fact, we've been talking about this, um, Anthony, as you know, and, and Rashid has been talking about this for a long time, but really since, you know, the resolution of the Human Rights Council back in 2012 basically said that human rights yeah. apply online equally as they do offline. Exactly. And, and, and part of, the, and part of the, the issue here, I think, is that organisations that were born as civil rights organisations or civil and political rights organisations um, didn't really know perhaps how to handle that transition. In fact, there was activists, as you say, in Tahrir Square and other places that quickly understood that, that immediately understood that. And I think many of the organizations, the traditional human rights organizations have struggled with trying to fuse technology onto their programs. And let me just ask you, you know, you mentioned some of the work that you're doing at the ACLU and it, it goes all the way from, you know, fighting for equal, for equal rights for same-sex relationships um, through to, you know, the, 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 the algorithm. Um, and the, the kind of the human rights implications of, a, of, a, of the black box of the algorithm in many of the tech platforms. Yeah, yeah. How do you, how does your team make a decision on the battles that you want to fight? Because in the US context, there are so many, I mean, you listed off 10, I think, yeah. in, in the last intervention. <laughs> what's the, what's the, what's your secret, what's your secret sauce here? Because I think many of us look to the ACLU as a sort of gold standard. It's like the first thing that we saw, yeah. like when Trump came into power was like the ads the yeah. next day, which said, see you in court. Yeah. Tell us about the prioritizing. And Rashida, I'd like to get your take on this as well, because we're all needing, to, we're all under a lot of pressure as, as civil and political rights organizations. We're struggling with that decision making process. You know, I, w I would just say, first off, on the, I think we're doing a fair job of wrapping our minds around the interface between technologies and the traditional civil rights and civil liberties issues we work on. I think we're further along than many of our sister organizations. I think we've been blessed. And that early on, my colleague said to me, look, we have nobody who understands code and you need to hire a bunch of technologists on staff. We have lots of lobbyists. We have lots of litigators. We have lots of comms and organizers, but no one who understands code. And I think that switch, there must have been around six, seven years ago, where we now have had a series of kind of, of generations of technologists who are on 
our payroll who give us real knowledge on the inside has really made a difference. Um, the way we ask, our, you know, how we decide where we're going to go, we ask three simple questions that really are hard to answer. Just, you know, how important is it? Uh, every injustice mm -hmm. is important to the person that's affected or implicated. But then you've really got to battle it out and say, define why it's really important for a larger group of people. We're not a direct services organization. So we have to think about broader impact, broader importance, broader systemic change. And, you know, and we decide we do in, we do defend and we provide representation to individuals. But we have to answer the importance question. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the representation we gave to Edward okay. Snowden is one guy. But it had massive implications and importance uh, to the whole world, yeah. I think. And one of the best decisions we ever made was to get behind Ed Snowden. And uh, I was lucky to have met him that first time in, in Moscow mm -hmm. when he was just becoming a, a client of the ACLU. Second question is, so you know it's important. You define how it's important. Do you have a theory of change? There's lots of things that I think are really important that I have no theory of change. And I don't run a church or a synagogue or a mosque. Right? This is not about belief and prayer. This is about real pragmatic mm -hmm. change that we have to uh, mm -hmm. move the ball down the field, mm -hmm. to use a sports mm -hmm. metaphor. So you have to be able to define you know, how you're going to make a, uh, a difference. So, for instance, one issue that's important, but I have no theory of change right now in the U.S., is the, is the role of money in politics. I think money corrupts. I think politicians mm -hmm. can be bought and sold for too cheap, too easily. But I think in the aftermath of the mm -hmm. Supreme Court decision, and Citizens United, I have no real theory of change and other than public financing, but that's not mm -hmm. going to happen at the national level, given this composition of Congress and given the economy that we're in. So don't do much, if anything, on campaign finance. Critically important, but it falls the second mm -hmm. question. The third one is, what mm -hmm. do we do that's distinct or additive? Because I really believe that while the ACLU is a great organization and we've got about 2000 staff nationwide, we're still... David to the government's Goliath. So we've got to, we can't reinvent the wheel. Yeah. There is no room for competition. There is no room for duplicative efforts. We've really got to think about what it is that we're doing that is distinct, additive. What's the net add onto these set of issues or topics or strategies and work it out with our peers and our colleagues in, in the fight for justice. You know, in the LGBT context, I do Thank very you. little federal lobbying on LGBT <clears throat> advocacy on the Hill. Human Rights Campaign Fund does that beautifully. Uh, Alfonso David and his whole team is largely focused on federal advocacy on LGBT communities. I have a part of one lobbyist, I think 0.3 of one lobbyist that looks at LGBT issues on the Hill. Where I have a unique advantage mm -hmm. is being able to do LGBT advocacy in some of the states where we're the only organization with an mm -hmm. office on the ground in every state and boots on the ground, the C3 mm -hmm. being tax deductible and C4, the political arm in every state. So I prefer to do much more of the LGBT advocacy in the states than try to work necessarily uh, on the Hill or Congress. That's an example of how we ask, is it important? Do we have a theory of change? And is what we do additive and, and make sure that we're not duplicative of what others yeah. are doing? So let, so let me, thanks for that. And it's, I, you know, as also an executive director of an organization, having to make similar decisions all the time, you know, like just look at what's happening this week in Hungary um, with, yeah. you know, the the the, uh, the firing of the CEO of Index and the, you know, basically all of the staff, all hundred staff, editorial staff resigning. Um, what's happening in Hong Kong uh, as, you know, just the national security law and the first time that's being used, yeah. I think, against the social media user. I mean, the, you know, this crazy list. I want to ask Rashida, um, I think for, and this is a critique for us as well as at Access Now, and I think for, for many civil and political organizations or human rights organizations that have focused on the human rights element in sort of determining the hierarchy. Um, but the racial justice piece, I think, has perhaps been missing. Um, and we've had a lot of internal discussion at Access Now about how to, like, face, how to actually be not just a multi-racial organization, but to be an organization that's actively committed to fight racism. Um, give us some, give us your thoughts on that. Um, and, you know, be, be frank, please, um, as you are, on, on sort of uh, guiding some of the organizations or advising or critiquing us on, on you know, how to, how to move forward in the right direction on this. 
Yeah, so I think as someone that made that critique, <laughs> I should probably explain some of it, and I think it can help give some context to some of the recommendations I have on how to center racial justice when doing civil rights and human rights work. And I think one of the major problems is what you just said is a tendency to do legal analysis in a way that looks at rights and liberties through a hierarchical frame, which means that some are prioritized over others when making these critical decisions about organizational priorities. Um, but I think the other problem is that a lot of the analysis of facts and the law tend to be both power blind and color blind. So the evaluations of harm, mm. risk of harm, and even the long term impacts become abstracted or universalized um, to such an extreme that it doesn't actually reflect the lived realities of those who are most directly impacted. And um, an example of this. And I, or sorry, another problem with that too is it can also lead to some of those problems persisting. And I think a good example, and that's on topic with this conference, is looking at the rhetoric and narrative around surveillance over the past couple of decades. And I think it wasn't until the past couple of years that the focus of both legal challenges and critiques of surveillance pa uh, practices have expanded beyond just privacy rights and intrusions and are now starting to look at equity and racial justice framings. But I think one of the problems with the sort of myopic privacy focus is it makes it seem like the risk of harm is equal for all when we know the reality is that um, these practices target certain communities and certain groups of people. And I think one of the long-term harms that stems, stems from this approach is that we also tend to miss um, other forms of oppressive government practices or even other forms of surveillance. So this is why we don't see the same level of public outcry um, or even legal challenges to practices by child welfare and public benefits agencies, even though they have equally invasive practices as law enforcement and they disproportionately burden poor people in black and brown communities. So I think within that context, mm. the best way to approach or at least center racial justice when thinking about civil rights and civil liberties issues or human rights frames is first you have to review the facts and do legal analysis in a way that's grounded in reality and is specifically paying attention to the actual harms and risk facing marginalized communities rather than the perceived harm to all because that leads to the disconnect i was just describing and then I think that legal mm -hmm. and often policy analysis also needs to include power and racial analysis, pertain, um, paying particular attention to the relational aspects of each um, and not just on a local level, but you need to look at this locally, nationally and in a global context. And then the last point, which I think aligns with some of what Anthony was describing, is that we have to start developing proactive approaches to preserving rights and liberties and advancing our civil rights and civil liberties because to date so much of our work has been reactive where we're reacting to new forms of government oppression reacting to new technological advancements but this can ultimately serve to stagnate the necessary structural and systemic reform and it also hinders our ability mm. to sort of imagine mm. radical alternatives <laughs> that don't preserve the hierarchies that exist in our society so i think it needs to be a sort of conglomerate of all of those approaches at once to really focus on who is harmed and what is the change that's necessary to ensure that society is meant for everyone. I think the one thing I would add, if I could, to Rashida's point about the need for thinking about how these, you know, how these technologies or how these tactics or concerns affect, especially communities of color, because there's differences in power and access mm -hmm. to, uh, to to pulling the levers. I think back at the, the litigation we did in the aftermath of 9-11 uh, that was targeting the FBI mm -hmm. surveillance of mosques, right? And part of what's interesting for me at the ACLU is I have all these silos. I have the National Security Project, I have the LGBT Project, I have the Technology and Speech Project, I have the Racial Justice Project, I have the LGBT Project, Reproductive Freedom. When I begin to see kind of a porousness across my projects is when I begin to think, hmm, this is what we need to kind of effectuate yeah. externally in the organization. <clears throat> the surveillance of mosque work was very much focused in the national security context with a lot of the MEMSA communities who were targeted by the FBI for the surveillance. And, it's, and it would, in a different world, you would have seen much more of my, 
kind of surveillance constituents, my privacy wonks, you know, my DKGs right. of the world, yeah. right? Who would have been equally swarming the field with the with the Muslim uh, the surveillance of the mosques and of the Islamic centers. I, I think similarly on right now playing out in Portland, it's 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 fascinating to me. You know, the these thugs mm -hmm. who are being deployed without uh, uh, insignias, who are arresting protesters and, and throwing them in the back of unmarked cars, which my counterparts in Russia and elsewhere are saying, welcome to the club, right? I'm like, I never thought I'd see this in America, but this is what's yeah. happening on our streets. Part of what's so fascinating, yeah. so my First Amendment kind of like aficionados, if you will, my zealots on the First Amendment and free speech and protest are finally understanding and seeing in real time the terrorism that border communities, especially Latinos along the U.S.-Mexican border communities, have experienced at the hands of Customs and Border Protection, CPB, right? These are out of control mm. thugs terrorizing communities that we have seen in colonias all along the U.S.-Mexican border, except now we're seeing it in Portland. Right. And that's why I find yeah. it like, the, the, I, and I don't like the word intersectionality because it's, unless you define it, mm. it just feels like a good, a good feel good buzzword. But this really does underscore mm. the need for thinking about these issues in a much more connected way. I think in the, especially on the set of issues that you work on, Brett, critically important mm. to infuse it mm. everywhere. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I have to agree with you, and I'm I'm actually hoping that this conversation will will move to like a three day um, hangout for the three of us or twenty of us to be able to sit down and have, you know, a, a full analysis of like where we're at right now in terms of being, you know, in the kind of civil and political rights, um, uh, <clears throat> like a cohort of organisations that can actually talk through some of this stuff because I feel like the comments, Rashida, that you make about um, not just about racial justice issues, but uh, but about like a systemic analysis of how we're operating. Like we can only get better, and I feel I feel like there's a lot, a lot of work to be done um, internally and externally. Uh, the problem is, as we sort of indicated earlier, is like much of this is happening in real time, and I want to throw in the yeah. COVID nineteen yeah. <laughs> pandemic into this discussion because I feel as though. Um, you know, what was already a crisis moment has become a crisis moment, you know, with a viral component to it. And I would love to hear, Rashida, from you, um, you know, what you think the pandemic has actually done to um, to America? And I mean, obviously, again, a big question, but how has this, this how has this unfurled so dramatically and, 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 and horribly? Uh, and I don't know if I'm breaking up there, but can you still hear me? Yes, you can. can you still hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, I just saw myself turn into a cyborg on screen, which is always concerning, um, particularly when you're doing a live interview. But regardless, um, Rashida, can you could you jump in there and let us know like what you what you're seeing and, and it's sort of how it plays, for instance, in terms of like you know, contract tracing apps or um, you know, the sort of decisions around it, some of the thinking around immunity passports, perhaps. Okay, I'm going to take this in two parts because that was a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Sorry. one <laughs> benefit. <laughs> I think one benefit of really what's been a crazy year this year is it's forcing a lot of conversations that we, as a community, a public don't want to have. And I think it's part of the problem in this country is that people don't want to face the ugliness of our history and how that history developed our current conditions. Um, and so you'll see different actors use coded language or even what I was describing earlier of this universalizing or obfuscation of many of um, the important issues we're facing today. And that just makes it easy to ignore, especially if you're not directly affected or even benefiting from the status quo. And I think what's happening now with COVID is we're being forced to have these conversations because it's not by accident that black and brown communities are disproportionately affected by um, the pandemic or by many of the other sort of related effects, that being the economy and many other issues. Um, but I also think we need to start talking more critically 
about issues like segregation in our country, because I think that directly relates to a lot of the problems that we're seeing being exacerbated by COVID-19 and many of the related issues. Um, and I think all of this, in order for us to undo any of this or to address this in a critical way, it's going to take a lot of deep in internal work, as you mentioned, Brett, for both individuals and institutions, because what we're talking about are issues of culture and accountability. And we're currently living in a culture that's driven by capitalism and white supremacy. So yes, we need legal reforms and they're definitely necessary, but what does legal reform mean when the law has been a primary tool for creating our current sort of state of racial inequity? And that's also why I think we need to critically engage with accountability because if the traditional terms or mechanisms that we look to for accountability or even redress don't necessarily work for all, then what necessarily needs to change so that we can have a more inclusive society. And then as far as the contact tracing, um, I think it, it's been interesting because I actually did work on HIV issues. And th once the contact tracing acts came up, a lot of people reached out to me and were like, what do you think? How does this connect to HIV? And I just saw this complete disconnect because it seemed to not understand both what is the actual practice around contact tracing in a non-digital way around infectious diseases right now and how does adding a digital application either exacerbate the problems of existing sort of analog practices or even undo what is helpful about those practices. And I think um, one of the pieces that misses from a lot of the conversations when we discuss contact tracing is the role of stigma. And I think COVID definitely still has a lot of stigma to it. And that sort of undoes or can inhibit any type of proactive um, public health sort of approach. And I think it, the sort of turn to contact tracing apps fits into what I was discussing earlier of this problem with tech solutionism in that tech companies think they can just apply data at scale and solve really complex issues. And then we're now seeing with many states and local governments applying these apps that they just simply don't work and, are actually, and probably are contributing more to the increase in infection and death rates that we're seeing. Th thanks so much for your comments um, there. I think we um, at Access Now we've also released, you know, a number of papers on. Firstly, this is like massive collection of data, um, and and we put out a report on the do's and don'ts of data collection in the context of of COVID, um, and then try to um, translate that uh, over to. Uh, to contact tracing and now also on immunity passports. And, and one of the things that we first try to analyze is uh, whether the, you know, whether these things actually work. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and you talk about HIV and the way in which HIV, you know, so this sort of, the, this idea was like, if we can collect all of the data and we can actually apply it in a way um, that, um, gives health professionals access to it oh but also national security or security services oh plus also you know the administration then we can actually trace those who you know who, who are infected or at risk of infection but the manual contact tracing that came before technology was like is a very very complicated and intrusive um, um, uh, approach to health and I think that, you know, we're just sort of like doing this in real time, brought the technology in, and now we're dealing with things like, you know, significant data leakage and the collection of personally identifiable information that we don't really need. No strategies for deletion of that data. No question about how a person can actually provide consent or otherwise. So, um, so Anthony, over to you on this. Let's talk about COVID-19 in the context of, of, of rights in the US. Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, First, let's stick with the contact tracings for some level of continuity. If we can the con uh, the web-based apps for contact tracing. Please, yeah. I, mean, I, I, you know, we've issued I think at least two white papers, also asking the questions and laying out the principles for how these web-based mm -hmm. apps might work if we deploy them. And again, it's our effort to try to be constructive. Um, there were pressures uh, uh, externally, internally. I think we're, we were all aligned that we did not want to bless any one technology or one approach or one group of 
researchers and scientists. There was a mad scramble to to get us to uh, to bless a particular project or endeavor, and we're just like, look, we'll raise the questions and we're going to audit them independently, and we'll continue to be critical if we need if we need be. Uh, you know, one thing that I find remarkable is that things have this kind of moment when everyone was talking about contact tracing and everyone was really focused on it and. You know, now that the pandemic is really overridden the entire country with kind of these kind of hot spots in the major states like in Texas and California, Florida, I know that the work is still ongoing. I get reports ep episodically, but it's just, I don't know if the tech world has just thrown its hands up in the air and said that we can't make this work because this response to the pandemic is just so botched. Um, be interesting to get your perspectives on it. I know I, I've seen reports on how it's working in other countries and both the kind of the challenges that Rashida raised in terms of uh, both the false uh, reports, maybe uh, driving people underground and, and creating, I think stigma is a very big issue that I remember trying to kind of, uh, kind of advocate that just because you think this disease can affect everyone equally, not everyone's gonna feel the impact of this disease equally. So I think we continue to need to be very discerning and asking the hard questions about it. Uh, I also think that the, that the idea that it, it's a little bit of techno optimism, that here we are battling this major new pandemic and this new virus that no one's known before. And all of a sudden the titans of tech can rush to the kind of rescue was you know, a bit of the, the hubris of tech, if you forgive the criticism. I don't mean that for any of the people in this room. The usually people in this room are the people who try to wield tech for good. Um, for us, COVID has at least four major fronts. In addition to the privacy uh, kind of issues I just mentioned, is one to deal with the communities that, are, that don't have the ability to do what I'm doing. I've been locked in my dining room table here, I was mentioning to you, uh, since mid-March. Turned off the clock behind me because I couldn't stand the ticking of the pendulum anymore. I've been able to socially distance and wash my hands and wear a mask. That's not true for 2.2 million people who are incarcerated in the US. So over 120 of our lawsuits have been focused on getting medically vulnerable people who are in prisons and jails and immigration detention centers, getting them out and trying to do it through advocacy, but also through litigation and the conditions of confinement. Some of this is enough to want make you kind of, you know, cry um, is the only human reaction you can have. I mean, the conditions of confinement, the way in which, you know, 80% of a particular prison can uh, now test positive for COVID, where kind of the, the inmates were, were subjected to poor conditions before a pandemic, and now especially with kind of guards and family members who are uh, not able or reluctant to come and, and do the work in the prisons or cells that there's greater isolation. And the judges are, uh, are reluctant to let people out because especially as this president brandishes a law and order uh, agenda as a way to kind of run for reelection, judges are un, 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 more unlikely to jump into that. And so it's been very frustrating. I think America has fundamentally failed. I look at what's played out in countries like Italy where they have uh, decreased their prison population by more than 10%. In other nations of the world, in Egypt even, Iran, uh, much more have been leaders of human rights when it comes to COVID and the jails and prisons. Second front for us has been around keeping some of the uh, controversial medical services available in the pandemic, abortion services. Uh, mm -hmm. Who would have guessed? I didn't see it coming, but you know, there are ideologues who use the pandemic as a way to close down abortion clinics. There are other ideologues who said we won't give you we won't give you access to an abortion or termination of a pregnancy unless you can get a COVID test, making it impossible for women to exercise their constitutional rights, uh, making it a requirement mm -hmm. for women to go into a, a doctor's office to pick up uh, the, the medical abortion uh, me medication that they could uh, use to terminate a pregnancy. All of that over over a dozen cases. Mm -hmm. Then there's been the 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 efforts to kind of ensure that people can vote, especially we have a November election coming up that our president wants to postpone or hints at postponing, but doesn't have the power to postpone, but doing it in such a way to try to suppress the vote among some constituents that he doesn't believe are going to vote for him. And for a lot of folks who don't want to line up on a, on a queue, 
or don't want to interface with a computer because touching a computer screen might make them at risk for a pandemic, the best thing to do is allow people to vote at home, vote by mail. Some of our states, like uh, Washington State, already have great systems. Our own president votes by mail, even when he criticizes the vote by mail procedure. So we've been litigating in more than 15 states to, for to force the states to adopt COVID-friendly voting practices. And it's, uh, we have 155 COVID-related lawsuits all in since mid-March. And I think it's really important for us to keep the pressure on because for like, just like Rashida said, it's, it's certain communities, it's the black and Latino and low income communities, the elderly uh, communities and nursing homes that have been mostly affected by this pandemic. And we've got to keep a real focus on those particular communities because they are most at risk. Um, Anthony, um, thank you for that. And thanks to, I, I will just take a moment to thank your team actually, who um, across all of the different um, civil liberty unions, by state and national that are working day and night to use the, the courts uh, and other mechanisms in order to protect American rights. I mean, I've been living in the US for uh, 12 years, you know, just before Obama came in and then and have seen, you know, this sort of rollout of the ACLU's work across presidents, actually, which has been really, really impressive. Obviously, a lot of work to do, a lot of internal reflection as well, how to make the organisation better and stronger and more um, reactive and responsive to, you know, issues from race to, to you know, sort of technology. Um, but thanks a lot to your team and, and for, you know, being great partners for Access Now as an organisation as well. Let me ask you both in the remaining minutes, Rashida, to you, um, can you give us uh, just looking forward? And I know that we're so struggling with the moment right now, but I'd love to hear like what you think the next achievable, perhaps winnable battle might be, or even if it's not achievable, winnable, like where you think the focus mm -hmm of the movement should be in the US going forward? Let's let's look at 2021. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm, I just wanna make it through this year. Um, I, <laughs> I think, I understand. <laughs> actually, no, okay, here. I think we need to not be distracted and actually keep sustain this sort of level of public outrage and what I see as more cohesion that's happening now to actually move for more systemic and structural change. So that way we can sort of do what both Anthony and I have referred to of like this more proactive and imaginative thinking of what is the theory of change of creating a more inclusive society? And I don't think you can wake up and do that tomorrow because there's a lot of structural barriers we need to break down. So I think it's trying to do that systemic analysis and figure out what are the biggest barriers to equity, especially racial equity, and how can we take those down as quickly as possible, but at the same time trying to envision what is that alternative vision of a society that we need to start working towards creating and what are the conversations we can start having now on like an individual level to help us get there because i think the thing is and over to you anthony and we might run a minute or two late which is fine um sure. but listen i mean you know president biden uh in place and 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 sort of what does that mean in terms of the what does it mean for you? Because as I said, like I've seen the ACLU yeah. and other, you know, yeah. like you had to deal with Guantanamo Bay under under Obama. Um, you had still to deal are. with. Still have two um, lawyers uh, working know, on Guantanamo uh, now. Oh, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. And I, the point being <laughs> is that like things, you know, if if the polls are right and and and, and, yeah. and Trump, you know, does go down, um, what does it mean for the U.S. Give me two scenarios, and I'm sure you're doing a lot of scenario planning there yeah. as you did in the yeah. previous election. Like, what does it going to look like under Biden? I, you know, I think first I appreciate Rashida's point that we need to just, uh, even the comments she made under her breath, we just need to make it through November. That's very much, I'm with you, my girl. I love you for saying that because I sometimes wonder whether I can make it through November. I eat my Wheaties and I wake up and I sleep well, but. It's a frothy, challenging time, and we need to all make it through November. And I and I would like to think, look, I'm 
I have to be an optimist because otherwise this is this would be a killer job. It's hard to kind of face what's yeah. going on and across all these issues in different locations. I, I, it's not a job for a pessimist or a cynic. It's just you know go to the private sector. <laughs> uh, you've got to have you've got to be idealistic and optimistic. You can't be naive, but we need we need clear-eyed optimists uh, in these jobs. Otherwise, nothing will get done. Uh, I, I, I've got to think. I've got to believe that as imperfect as Biden is, and he's imperfect, and I've got to believe that the, the, the moment will make the president. And I've got to believe that the country that comes mm. out of this pandemic and this recession, the country that comes out of uh, Donald Trump's four years of running amok over our norms and rules and laws, the country that comes out of this the techno optimist bubble being burst and now greater questions being raised of these social media giants like Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. I got to believe that the country coming out of these crises uh, and the world actually, yeah. the, 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 the society has got to be better than the one that went into it. And I think Biden will have to be fully boxed into a corner, right? That there is going to be nothing we're going to get. They're playing a very conservative election. And if if that's any indication, then he's going to play it very conservatively in the first couple of months of his presidency. And this is not a time for conservatism. This is a time for boldness, for vision, for audacity. And the, the place where I've been spending a lot of time, and Rashida, you and I can talk after we're off this panel, is that I've been spending a bunch of time trying to read through the moments when we made you know, huge leaps or tried to take huge leaps forwards on social issues. And I, what we need is like a third reconstruction, right? I've been thinking a lot about reading a lot about LBJ, a very unlikely protagonist for racial justice and civil rights. You know, but the time it was foisted upon him and then he had to pick up the mantle and kind of play the role he played with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act. We need the kind of ambition mm. of a third reconstruction on social policy in the U.S. that really speaks to the adversity and the challenges of the moment. Because a little bit of fix here and a little bit of fix there, the laundry list of what is mm. broken under Trump is, uh, is long and they have to get fixed. They can't just pretend that it's all going to go away. But you need a boldness of vision that that's going to come and that's going to be infused in the highest levels of our government if it's come if it comes from us and it's demanded from us so that's that's how i mm. stay optimistic and energetic i mean that's you know to be able to have come through all of this and you and your team and many you know unsung heroes that are working on the front lines um, a lot of people to come with that sense sense of op yeah a lot of people that, that sense of optimism that there's a possibility and i think that yeah, it's not just, and this conversation is obviously focused on the U.S. because of the the, the interviewees or the the participants on the call. You too, but actually, there's multiple discussions in multiple jurisdictions um, about how do we get through this period and how does what we call you know shrinking civic space, um, how do we actually grow civic space now? How do we actually uh, wow, look at that cyborg that I've become. Um, how do we, how do we, how do we grow civic space, and how do we actually empower us to um, force our leaders to actually come up with and implement the bold vision that we as citizens want from them? Um, so, with that, I'm going to close us down because we're over time. And thanks to both of you for a really fascinating discussion. Um, you know. Um, super both impressive in terms of your analysis but also your practical approach to finding solutions for us so thank you very much thank you